I'm going to read. Um, I'm going to read. This is the arc for uh, my next book that's coming out. It's called Hard Magic. It's uh, book one of the Grim War Chronicles. It's uh, coming out. Uh, the uh, ebook is out now. The early ebook is out now, and the um, hardcover is coming out in uh, May. And they're all so it's limited edition hardcover. Last one did good, so Tony decided to throw some hardcovers out there. I was very excited. Okay, <clears throat> this book is a. Um, I've been calling it diesel punk because that's kind of an easier way to describe it rather than saying more pulp alternate history fantasy adventure novel. It's uh, it takes place in a world. It's uh, takes place in 1932 in a world where magic appeared in the 1850s. Okay, so very similar to ours. It kind of diverged in the 1850s, and we're now about here. So. Go ahead and I'm going to start reading. I'm going to jump around a little bit, but I'll start here in the prologue. Each chapter starts with a, uh, a quote from a historical figure that I made up. <laughs> so, <clears throat> One general law leading to the advancement of all organic beings, namely multiply and vary, let the strongest live and the weakest die. The appearance of esoteric and ethereal abilities, magical fires and feats of strength in recent decades are the purest demonstration of natural selection. Surely in time, that general law will require the extinction of traditional man. Charles Darwin, On the Origin of Man and Selection of Human and Magical Abilities, 1879. <clears throat> El Nido, California. Okies. The Portuguese farmer spat on the ground, giving the evil eye to the passing automobiles weighed down with baskets, bushels, and crates. The cars just kept coming up the dusty San Joaquin Valley Road like some kind of Okie wagon train. He left to make sure all his valuables were locked up and his Sears and Roebuck single shot 12 gauge was loaded. The tool shed was locked and the shotgun was in his hands when the short little farmer returned to watch. One of the Ford Model T's rattled to a stop in front of the farmhouse fence. The old farmer leaned on his shotgun and waited. His son would talk to the visitors. The boy spoke good English. So did he, but not as well. Just good enough to take the Dodge truck in the Merced to buy supplies. And it wasn't like the mangled, inbred garbage dialect the Oki spoke was English anyway. The farmer watched the transients carefully as his son approached the automobile. They were asking for work. They were always asking for work. Ever since the dust had blown up and cursed their stupid land, they'd all driven west in some oaky exodus until they ran out of farmland and stopped to harass the Portuguese, who had gotten there first. Of course they'd been here first. Like, he gave a shit if these people were homeless or hungry. He'd been born in a hut on the tiny island of Terceda and had milked cows every single day of his life until his hands were leather bags so strong he could bend pipe. The San Joaquin Valley had been a hole until his people had shown up, covered the place in Holsteins, and put the Mexicans to work. Now these Okies show up, build ten cities, and bitch about how the government should save them, and sneak out at night to rob the Catholics. It really pissed him off. My grandpa was a Portuguese dairy farmer from the San Joaquin Valley, so I had to diverge there for a second. Okay. And he was not... Grapes of Wrath was not told from the Portuguese perspective. I just say that. Okay. <laughs> it always amazed him how much the Okies could fit into an old Model T. He'd come from Terceda on a steamship, spinning weeks in a steel hole between hot steam pipes. He'd owned a blanket, one pair of pants, a hat, and a pair of shoes with holes in them. He'd worked his ass off in a Portuguese town in Rhode Island, neck deep in fish guts, married a nice Portuguese girl, even if she was from the screwed up island of St. George, which everyone from Terceda knew as the ass crack of the Azores, and saved up enough money doing odd jobs to come out here to another Portuguese town and buy some scrawny Holsteins. Five cows, a bull, and 20, 20 years of backbreaking labor had turned into 100 cow, 120 cows, 50 acres, a Ford tractor, a Dodge pickup, a good milk barn, and a house with six whole rooms. By Portuguese standards, he was living like a king. So he wasn't, given, he wasn't going to give these Okies shit. They weren't even Catholic. They should have to work like he did. He watched the Okie father talking to his son as his son patiently explained for the hundredth time that there wasn't any work and they needed to head towards Los Banas or maybe Chowchilla. Not that they were going to work anyway, when they could just break into his milk barn and steal his tools to sell for rock gut moonshine again. His grandkids were poking their heads around the house, checking out the Model T, but he'd warned them enough times about the dangers of outsiders, and they stayed safely away. He wasn't about to have his family corrupted from their good Catholic work ethic by being exposed to bums. Then he noticed the girl. She was just another scrawny Oki kid, barely even a woman yet, so it was surprising that she hadn't already had three kids from her brothers. But there was something different about this one, 
something he'd seen before. The girl glanced his way, and he knew what had set him off. She had gray eyes. Mary, Mother of God, the old farmer muttered, fingering the crucifix at his neck. Not this shit again. His first reaction was to walk away, leave it alone. It wasn't any of his business, and the girl would probably be dead soon enough, impaled through her guts by some random tree branch or a flying bug stuck in an artery. And he didn't even know if the gray eyes meant the same thing to Anoki as it did to the Portuguese. For all he knew, she was just a normal girl who just looked funny. And she'd go have a long and stupid life in an oaky tent city, popping out 15 kids who'd also break into his milk barn and steal his tools. The girl was studying him, dirty hair whipping in the wind, and he could just tell. Fucking shit down, he said in English, which was the first English any immigrant who worked with cows learned. He'd seen what, a, what happened to the gray eyes when they weren't taught correctly, and as much as he despised Okies, he didn't want to see one of their kids with their brains spread all over the truck, all over the road, because they magically appeared in front of a speeding truck. Leaning the shotgun against the tractor tire, he approached the Model T. The Okie parents looked at him with mild belligerence as he approached their daughter. The old farmer stopped next to the girl's window. There were half a dozen other kids crammed in there, but they were just regular, desperate, starving Okies. This one was special. He lifted his hat so she could see his eyes were the same color as hers. He tried his best English. You, girl, gray eyes. She pointed at herself, curious, but didn't speak. He nodded. You jump? Travel? She didn't understand, and now her idiot parents were staring at him in slack-jawed ignorance. The old farmer took one hand and held it out in a fist. He suddenly opened it. Poof! Then he raised his other hand as far away as possible. Poof! And made a fist. She smiled and nodded her head vigorously. He grinned. She was a traveler, all right. You know what she does? The Oki father asked. The old farmer nodded, finding his own magic inside and poking it to wake it up. Then he was gone, and instantly he was on the other side of the Model T. He tapped the Oki mother on the arm through the open window and she shrieked. All his grandkids cheered. They loved when he did that. His son just rolled his eyes. The Oki father looked at the Portuguese farmer, back at his daughter, and then back at the farmer. The gray-eyed girl was happy as could be that she'd found somebody just like her. The father scowled for a long time, glancing again at the strange child that had caused him so much grief, and then at all the other starving mouths he had to find a way to feed. Finally, he spoke. I'll sell you her for twenty dollars. The old farmer thought about it. He didn't need any more people eating up his food, but his brother and sisters had all ended up dead before they had mastered traveling, and this was the first other person like him he'd seen in twenty years. But he also hadn't gotten where he was by getting robbed by Okies. Make it ten. The girl giggled and clapped. So, as the introduction to one of our one of our first characters, um, I. <laughs> I'm going to skip ahead a little bit and uh, read the last little bit from the, the opening. <clears throat> this is all taking place in 1927. <clears throat> Billings, Montana. Every day was the same. Every prisoner in the special prisoner's wing of the Rockville State Penitentiary had the exact same schedule. You slept, you worked, you got put back in your cage. You slept, you worked, you got put back in your cage. Repeat until time served. Working meant breaking rocks. Normal prisoners were put on work crews to be used by mayors trying to keep budgets low. They got to go outside. The convicts and special wing got to break rocks in a giant stone pit. Some of them were even issued tools. The name of the facility was just a coincidence. One particular convict excelled at breaking rocks. He did a good job at it because he'd done a good job at everything he'd set his mind to. First he'd been good at war, and now he was good at breaking rocks. It was just his nature. The convict had single-minded determination, and once he got to pushing something, he just couldn't find it in himself to stop. He was as constant as gravity. After a year, he was the finest rock breaker and mover in the history of Rockville State Penitentiary. Occasionally, some other prisoner would try to start trouble because he thought the convict was making the rest of them look bad. But even in a place dedicated to holding felons who could tap into all manner of magical affinities, most were smart enough not to cross this particular convict. After the first few left in bags, the rest understood that he just wanted to be left alone to do his time. Occasionally some new man, eager to show off his power, would step up and challenge the convict, and he too would leave the bag. The warden did not blame the convict, the convict for the violence. He understood the type of men he had under his care, and knew that the convict was just defending himself. Between helping lead the quota for the gravel quarry that padded the warden's salary under the table, and for ridding the special wing of its most dangerous and troublesome men, the warden took a liking to the convict. 
He read the convict's records, he came to respect the convict as a man for the deeds he'd done before committing his crime. He was the first special prisoner ever granted access to the extremely well-stocked but very dusty prison library. So the convict's schedule changed. Sleep, work, read. Sleep, work, read. So now the time passed faster. The convict read books by the greatest minds of the day. He read the classics. He began to question his power. Why did his power work the way it did? What separated him from normal men? Why could he do things that he could do? Because of its relation to his own specific gifts, he started with Newton, then Einstein, finally Bohr and Heisenberg, and then every other mind that had pontificated on the science related to his magic. And when he had exhausted the books on science, he turned to the philosopher's musings on the nature of magic and the mystery of where it had suddenly come from and all its short history. He read Darwin, he read Schumann, and Kelser, and Reed, and Spengler. When that was done, he read everything that was left. The convict began to experiment with his power. He would sneak bits of rock back into his cell to toy with, reaching deep inside himself, twisting, testing, always pushing with that same doggy determination that made him the best rock breaker. And when he got tired of experimenting with rocks, he started to experiment on his own body. Eventually, all those hours of testing and introspection enabled him to discover things about magic that very few other people would ever understand. But he kept that to himself. Then one day, the warden offered the convict to deal. So, that's the intro. Um,